Okay, so <laughs> now we got all set up. Today we are going to be playing some chess live from YouTube. Uh, this is something that is completely new for me, and I'm not sure how long this stream is going to end up being, but just wanted to try out the YouTube live feature, and if it turns out to be pretty smooth, uh, we can try it again in the future. So let me just pull up the stream over here on my other computer, and we can go ahead and get started. So, yeah, um, okay, this is looking pretty good. All right. So what we're going to do is play some chess on leechess.org. And we're going to be playing 10 plus O games with the intent of education. We're going to try to play uh, some really instructive games today. And we're going to see how it goes. Uh, I am excited. Let's get this started. So let's jump into the 10 minute pool. Uh, okay. Let's play against, oop, 10 minute pool. And let's get this party started. Okay, so it looks like nobody's biting just yet. Uh, we will see if we have any luck. Hopefully somebody wants to Hopefully somebody wants to play. Let's see though. Okay. Um, nobody's biting just yet. But we have learned the important skill of being patient. So we'll exercise our patience right now. Uh, in waiting for a game and hopefully we can get one I don't want to disappoint okay looks like Max is asking do you ever play 960 uh, I do play some 960 from time to time but I cannot say that I do it too often um, and by the way, welcome to Max. Uh, this is our first ever live stream. So you would be the first ever person to comment on a live stream. That's, uh, that's pretty cool. Hmm. We are not getting a game. Dang. Come on. Let's see if, let's see if someone bites. We'll wait a little bit longer and then we'll see if we can't get another game going. Uh, maybe some 5 plus 0 people might be willing to play that. Uh, but we'll see. Worst case, we'll check if there's an arena we can join. Lee Chess has all these arenas. Uh, welcome to everyone who's just coming in. First time we're doing a live stream, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, I'm excited though. I think I think there's definitely some promise. Okay, let's join this hourly arena. Max says one small step. I agree, one small step. Okay. Now we've joined this arena. We're going to be playing some uh, some people here. Uh, we are joining about an hour into the arena, so we're probably not going to win. But you know, we'll we'll do our best, and that's all we can do. So let's see. Let's see if we can get a game in this arena. We joined. We're in 136th place, which is not great. Uh, but <laughs> we we just joined, and yeah, feel free to feel free to say hi in the chat. I want to interact with you guys. Any chess-related stuff? Just how your Saturday's going? <laughs> Drew Kosla says, "Who's this giraffe chess dude?" LMAO, my good friend Drew Kosla. Uh, Okay, so we have a game, and we have the white pieces. Let's have some fun. <laughs> Play 1v3 or I'm unsubscribing, man. Okay, I'll try to make it up to you by pushing my B-pawn. I didn't see that message in time. But, okay, my opponent clearly has his own plans here. So maybe I'll go for the King's Indian attack. 
and uh, and play like this. Let's see. Okay, bishop to g2. He's trying to mate me. He might be trying to mate me. Knight to g4. Okay, but we don't fall for it. He was trying to go queen takes on f2. Wow, he's really insisting on this f2 pawn. But I'm afraid I cannot allow him to take it. Uh, yeah, so we go pawn to d4. And we can keep pushing him back. So this bishop b4 move is not great either. For the same reason that bishop to c5 wasn't good. And it's because he gets pushed away pretty easily. So here again, we can play this c3 move. And we're pushing him away pretty easily. Uh, okay, he goes bishop to d6. This too is an awkward placement for the bishop. Now I'm starting to think, do I go pawn to e5, hit the bishop one more time, or do I try to fork the bishop and the queen by bringing my knight to the c4 square? There are a couple of options here. I think I'm going to start by going knight to d2, with the idea that I want to bring my knight into the c4 square. So my opponent plays his pawn up, which doesn't really stop me from doing this. So I'm still going to play this move. I'm attacking the queen and I'm attacking the bishop concurrently. Uh, okay, queen here. This is interesting. Now, I have a couple of different options. One is pawn to d5, just attacking the queen directly. Uh, another option would be pawn to e5, attacking the bishop. And e5 is a pretty good move because it also opens up this bishop's diagonal. So let's say I play pawn to e5, and this bishop goes somewhere. Now, I bring my knight out of the way, and the bishop attacks the queen. So this move is quite powerful in that regard. And one more thing is not only am I attacking the queen, but I also just noticed I'm attacking the knight. So my opponent has some serious problems to deal with here. Uh, this move d5 doesn't help. If you are new to chess, you might not know about the rule of en passant, but it is a very powerful move you can play in chess. So if you have a pawn on your opponent's fifth rank, and uh, your opponent pushes two squares, you can actually take it like this. And it's a, it's a bit of a tricky move that is hard to explain to some beginners, but now I'll be attacking the queen, attacking the bishop, and attacking the knight. So my opponent might be in some serious trouble here uh, with all of these pieces attacked at the same time. Out of all of these, I think the bishop is, is a valuable piece to take, so we're going to go ahead and take that one, uh, and then we'll take the knight, and we're just sitting here up two pieces, so we can't complain about the position. Okay, f5 is interesting. I think before I retreat my queen, I'll try to provoke him into creating one more weakness. Let's see if we can provoke him into playing g6. Indeed we do. Now these dark squares near the king are looking a lot juicier, a lot weaker for my opponent, but a lot juicier for me. Uh, and that's because he doesn't have a dark square bishop. So this is an important factor in the position, my opponent's lack of a dark square bishop. And that's why these squares will be a lot weaker, considerably weaker. Druv saying, it's okay, but b3 better feature in this game. I will do my best. I'll try to make b3 a reality. Okay, let's take this rook over here. Uh, now we're winning an exchange, so we win the rook. And I hope my opponent plays bishop b7. Yes, he does it. Now we trick him. So we take, and now we get this nasty fork. Ooh, ooh, that's a tough look. Man, so <laughs> we got that really, really nice um, knight fork there. And now we're sweeping up all his pieces. Let's do it. And bishop h6 with mate. That's a nice one. I'm happy with that. Let me know if you guys have any openings you guys want to see. Uh, I'm happy to try and uh, try and play it. Curious thoughts saying, ah, you played a uh, King's Indian attack. I just learned that opening. Awesome. Yeah, it was a King's Indian attack. Uh, it's a good opening to have in your repertoire for sure. So King's Indian attack is actually a lot more viable of an option for a lot of players than the king's indian defense uh you tend to get some really strong really strong positions okay we have white again let's go for another e4 see what we can get e5 now let's play some sort of gambit i don't know that much uh 
opening theory and one e4, but you know what? We're going to try. Uh, Max is asking, is cheating common in OTB tournaments? It is actually not all that common in OTB tournaments. There was one recent, uh, one recent story of this grandmaster whose name was Igor Rouses, uh, I think it was. But uh, yeah, other than Igor Rouses, I'm pretty sure that uh, cheating is pretty, pretty controlled and over the board chess. Uh, Thiago Rondon saying Rui Lopez would be really good. Okay, I can try to get a Rui Lopez. Uh, I will do my best. Okay, now my opponent has castled. And I'm wondering if I can just take this pawn off the board. Because once I take this pawn, it also allows me to get in this d4 move. Oh wow, he takes. What is this? This must be some idea I don't know. Maybe he's got us in some sort of trap. Uh, so what happens if I just take this? I guess we'll find out. Maybe this is some sort of trap. Uh, Drew is saying the chat is popping now. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Uh, and Max asking, have I ever faced one? I actually do think I have faced a cheater before. Okay, we got a resignation from our opponent. That was pretty quick. Uh, Max asking, have I ever faced a cheater? I do think I've faced one cheater in my life. So I was playing in this uh, this is a hilarious story, by the way. So I was playing in the National Open, or no, it was the North American Open. It was a tournament in Las Vegas, uh, Nevada. And I was playing this guy, and I had like a slightly better position, and I was happy with, uh, with the position I had. And then he gets up and goes to the bathroom, or he says he'd went to the bathroom for literally like more than an hour. It was like an hour and 30 minutes. So this guy is gone, and I have no idea where he is. And then he comes back an hour and 30 minutes later. So I call over the arbiter, and I'm like, hey, this guy's been gone for like 90 minutes. And the arbiter was like, yeah, that is kind of sketchy. Uh, and he asked the guy where he was. And then this guy, uh, I don't think he was, he, he was like, uh, I don't know. He wasn't speaking for whatever reason, so he just takes a napkin right next to him. And he writes on it, he's like, he writes diarrhea on the napkin. So this man literally leaves for 90 minutes, and then he comes back, and uh, and his excuse for why he's been gone all the time was just the word diarrhea. And to this day, I still do not buy it. Okay, let me talk a little bit about chess. So the reason I just sacrificed a full bishop is because after he takes back, I have this little check right here, and I'm forking the king and the bishop, so it was only a temporary piece sacrifice. Uh, I sacked a piece, but I'm going to get it back now. So c6, now I'll take my piece back. And I have this big center. Uh, my queen's on a good square. Drew's saying, I expect the Lempert Gambit to be played in this stream. Yeah, uh, if you guys are subscribers to the channel, you know that I recently created a video about the uh, Lempert Gambit. So... Yeah, I, I do want to feature it in the stream. I should play it if I get the black pieces. We've been blessed with uh, three three whites in a row. So we'll see if we can get the black pieces. Okay, so now knight to f6 has been played. And I'm thinking, do I want to go for this pin right here with bishop to g5? Uh, now, I could also go knight to f3, just bring my knight to a good central square. I'm tempted to do this, and I do want to take advantage of my extra space. So, okay, queen to b6 is a good move. I'm just going to castle. My opponent might go for bishop to b4, I'm thinking. Okay, he doesn't. He goes bishop e7. Uh, he's just playing very solidly. Now, I want to take advantage of his play somehow. So if I go bishop to e3, I feel like I have a lot of compensation if he takes this pawn. In fact, this pawn might just be poisoned. So if he takes, now I get the feeling I can go rook to b1. The queen goes to c2, and I go rook a2. And if you guys can follow that calculation, that's, uh, that's a full, uh, full queen. That's a queen trap. So okay, he, doesn't, he opts uh, not to go for it. 
Now, I can try pushing forward with this d5 move, uh, which basically just opens up the center of the board, and I'm tempted to do it. It looks like a pretty good move, so I'm actually just going to go for it. Now, I unleash a discovered attack on this queen. Drew's saying I ha that he had a nosebleed uh, in an Arizona tournament. Lasted like 20 minutes. That's so unfortunate. Uh, was that the game that you drew? So that's crazy if you like had a nosebleed for like 20 minutes in a 90-minute game. And then coming back to draw someone that's like 500 points higher rated than you. That'd be pretty crazy. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, right here I have this discovered attack. Okay, so he goes here. And he clearly does not believe that his queen is getting trapped. So it's up to me to prove him wrong. Uh, now, if I go here, let me start by taking this pawn. I, I feel like that's an important note uh, in this position that I'll start by taking the pawn. And he presumably has to go here. Because if he takes the pawn back, now I go rook to b1. Queen c2, rook a2, and I actually am trapping the piece. So, um, yeah, he has to he has to be careful. You're saying that he lost that game, but it might have been drawn if he didn't have a nosebleed. <laughs> yeah, that sucks. Sorry about that. So here I'm thinking, I'm thinking my opponent has to go for this move. Okay, he doesn't. He goes knight to e8. And now, can I take this? Okay, so his idea is clearly knight to d6, bring the knight in. Uh, so let's say I go rook to b1, I'm hitting the queen. Then he goes knight to d6, he's attacking my queen. And let's just say I go back with my queen. This queen on b2 is still trapped. So, uh, okay, Max asking why I needed to take the pawn. That's a, that's a good question. So the reason that I took the pawn here is because I don't want to allow my opponent the chance to take this pawn with an attack against my queen. So I thought I might as well just take his pawn uh, and then when he does something, now I can try to trap the queen and it's harder for him to attack my queen. So he's tried to make it happen by going knight e8, knight d6. He's really trying to make this happen. Uh... But we're going to try and discourage it, and we're going to try to trap his queen anyways. So rook to b1, the queen has almost no squares. It has this square. Uh, now, I wanted rook to a2. I thought this would be the best way to trap the queen. And knight d6 seems very important in this position. Um, but there's a slight trick here too. So if he goes knight d6, and I take this pawn, let's see. Uh, so we're taking it with check, that's the first thing. If he takes back with the rook, now I sack my queen for the rook. So I'm down a full queen for a rook. But after I sack my queen, he takes back. And then I take his queen. So I actually win a whole rook from the exchange. Uh, and it looks like the this stream has likes, uh, which I which I had no idea. I didn't know that that was, that was a thing, that you could like a stream. But I'm assuming it's helpful. So... If you guys are enjoying the stream, go ahead and uh, like the video. Uh, okay, so he smartly steps to the side. He avoids this queen sacrifice. Good call. Now I'm trying to see if there's any way that I can keep this queen trapped. So in order to do that, I have to make sure that my queen still defends my knight. And I have to make sure my queen is still covering this square. So it is slightly tricky. Um, one move that does all that though is queen uh, over to d4. So I'm keeping the queen trapped. I'm keeping my knight defended. I'm stopping him from coming out to d3. For example, if I'd gone to c5 with the queen, my opponent's queen escapes as well. So I didn't want to allow that. I think queen d4 is the best all-purpose move. And now my opponent forced to give up the queen. Maybe he doesn't realize I have this knight here, but... Yeah, this is all but over now. So we win the knight, we win we win the queen, sorry. <laughs> we win the queen, now we win the knight. Uh, and we're up a lot. We're actually up a full queen. 
So, can't complain. Let's go knight g5 here, attacking both the rook and threatening mate. And we have a little trick here too. If our opponent takes our knight, we just give this check on the back rank. And it's a back rank mate. Okay, he does it. And now we get this back rank mate, queen e8, and queen takes rook once he blocks. So we are in a good position here. Definitely happy with this one. Uh, yeah, my opponent is giving it some thought, but now we get a resignation. Awesome. Let's go back to the tournament. We are up to 2412. That is our rating. So 2412, we're pushing for uh, 2500. That's our goal. So we're trying to get to 2500 and hoping we can get some YouTube subscribers out of this stream too. So if you are not subscribed to the channel and you're watching this stream, uh, welcome. Uh, this is my YouTube channel. I basically try to post instructive chess stuff on this channel. Uh, we have a bunch of different stuff, including rapid games with commentary, uh, chess opening overviews, stuff like that. And lots of great stuff to come, especially in the opening department. So, okay, let's go for the Sicilian Let's make it up to Druv and play the four knights Sicilian. Max asking, why was the rook-queen exchange preferable when you could take his queen without losing yours? Okay, so in that position, if you still have that position in your head, um, if you can still visualize that one, basically his knight on d6 was attacking my queen on c4. So that's what, I, that's what I was saying when I was saying sack the queen before taking his queen, because he was attacking my queen. But for those of you who are just joining uh, and you, you don't know what I'm talking about, you can always watch the, watch the live stream at some later point uh, when it goes up on YouTube. Okay, so here we have a normal Sicilian, and what I want to do is close up the center. So a line that I like to play here is pawn to e5. Now, you might think, uh, it's blocking your bishop, so that's why it's not a good move. But in reality, it is absolutely fine to play this move because we're controlling d4. Oftentimes in chess, to get something, you've got to give something. And in this position, what we're giving up is the great diagonal of our bishop, but what we're getting uh, is the control over the d4 square. So now we'll go knight to e7. This is a pretty good square for the piece protecting the other knight here. Uh, Shrey Swaroop saying, SMH, Karo Khan, Superior. I love the Karo Khan. It is my favorite opening of all time. So you don't have to tell me that twice. Uh, I I love that opening. And we will definitely be playing some Karo Khans today. Cynthia Ayerdi saying, hey, what's up, Cynthia? Good to have you. Okay, now my opponent is being stubborn with this bishop. He doesn't want to trade it off just yet so let's castle uh and one of the points behind me castling is now i want to get out of the pin so my opponent is pinning my knight to my queen and i just want to get out of it so move my queen uh to the side something like this okay knight to c3 he is trying to control this d5 square now might be a good opportunity to play this a6 move and what a6 does is it forces some sort of commitment by this bishop. Uh, and if my opponent's bishop commits to taking my knight, okay, which he doesn't, if he took, I want to take back with the pawn so that I can control this d5 square even more. He goes back to c4, okay, that's reasonable. Uh, now I'm thinking about playing d6, just solidify the position, make sure both of these pawns are protected, my bishop might be coming out to e6. So we do have some, some pretty good options here. Uh, and welcome to everybody who's just joining. h3, okay. Now, maybe I bring the bishop out. This doesn't seem like such a bad option. Uh, maybe I bring the king to h7. It's just a pretty normal move that, that one would play in this position. Or maybe I put the queen on c7. Lots of very tempting options here. Uh, I think queen c7 is the best just because it unpins. And I don't want to stay in this pin for the whole game. 
So I will unpin myself here. And now I have more flexibility. So I can play f5 after moving the king. Uh, I can start pushing over here on the queen side. And by the way, if I do want to play f5, I do have to do something with this king first. So I have to I have to move the king because otherwise this diagonal becomes a problem. For example, f5 here, my opponent takes with a double check. The bishop and the knight would be checking me, and that's impossible to defend. So knight to d5, I'm actually going to take this knight. I don't think that this, uh, this trade really favors my opponent, uh, just because my knight on e7 wasn't fantastic anyways, but he goes for it nonetheless. Uh, bishop takes on d5. Now, I want to get this f5 move in. So I'm going to move the king to the side and try to play f5. Drew saying the Sicilian is superior to the Caro on any day. Man, that's a strong claim. What if Shrey has been watching my uh, Caro Khan series? Then he's equipped for battle. Thiago saying everyone knows the Borg defense is miles better than both the Sicilian and the Caro. Uh, so the Borg defense is g5, right? 1e4, uh, g5. And it's supposed to be the uh, reverse of the grob, I believe. I Maybe my information is, is wrong, but I believe that's what the Borg defense is. And I'm afraid I cannot... <laughs> I'm afraid I cannot agree that the Borg is, is the best. Uh, okay, so our opponent takes... Now we have a couple of different ways to recapture. If we take with the bishop, we're keeping our position solid. So we're not making any significant alterations to the structure. If we take with the pawn, we are making our king a bit more vulnerable and open. But we still retain the possibility of pushing forward and attacking. So this is a pivotal moment in the game. I think I'll take this opportunity to take with the bishop. Because I don't really want to open up my king so much, leave it so exposed. Druv Kosla challenging another member of the Tower of Power to a 1v1. Oh my. This is going to be the main event now. Two loyal giraffe chess subscribers battling it out. <laughs> Thiago says, yeah, that's it's exactly that. It's just like the Grob. Yeah, the, the Grob... I faced the Grob once before over the board. It's an interesting opening. It's like, it's like you're playing the English, uh, the English opening with c4 and g3, except you mouse slipped. But I can see how the Grob could be effective in online chess. Like, let's say you play g4 and your opponent plays knight to f6, then you can already play g5. Uh, <laughs> okay, my opponent is playing a delayed Grob with g4 now. Uh, I guess he must have overheard us talking about all this grob stuff and thought, man, I got to get a piece of this action. But I'm not so sure if, if d4 is the best move here. Or sorry, g4 is the best move here. Uh, I think I'll just retreat my bishop back to d7. And I really want to try and double here on the file. Uh, if I can get two rooks on this f file, that would be super juicy. So I'll try to do that. Uh... And if I go rook f4, though, I have to be slightly concerned that it will be pushed away immediately. But one can dream, can't they? Okay, he goes bishop g3. Maybe he's watching. Philosopher, if you're watching, get out of my stream. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, he goes bishop g3, stopping my rook f4 idea. That's all fair. Now, I'm thinking about knight to e7, just hitting against this bishop. And I actually like that move, knight e7. So my idea is I'm I'm attacking this bishop. Uh, if he moves here to e4, I might be able to trap him. That would be a pretty juicy piece trap. Uh, so he doesn't fall for it. He goes bishop to b3. Very smart guy, this one. Now, let's go bishop to c6. Just put more pressure on his position. I've noticed that g4 creates some really significant weaknesses. So we're going to try and take advantage of those weaknesses uh, by putting a bishop on this diagonal. Knight to h4. Wow. Okay. So, he's targeting the g6 pawn, I guess. Uh, 
maybe what I want to do is get a queen on this diagonal as well. So I'm thinking about how to do that. One clear cut way to do so seems to be just push the pawn to b5. And if I can get b5 in, then I uh, come back, bishop b7, queen c6, and I get this battery on the diagonal. So that is something I'm very strongly considering. Uh, I'm also considering this knight d5, knight to f4. This seems like a pretty good way to go as well. So I'm tempted by a lot of good options, but I'm going to settle on b5. I always have knight d5 later if I want with the idea of coming into f4. So I'm going to settle on this for now. Uh, I've been told recently that I play a lot of positional chess on the channel. And a lot of people like the sharper gambit stuff. So let me know in the chat if you guys think, uh, think the positional stuff is more helpful. Like grinding out your opponent or the gambits. Like giving up a pawn on move 2 or something like that. Feel free to let me know. Uh... But yeah, at the moment, we're trying to take advantage of the weak light squares our opponent has created. Uh, okay, queen to e2. Now I'm starting to think that the idea here is to go d4. Um, that, seems, that seems like what my opponent's trying to do. Because he's keeping an eye on this knight on e7. So if he goes d4 and I take, he comes down and snags my knight. And that would not be appreciated. So now I'm thinking about this knight to d5 move just because the knight would be so good on f4. Uh, and queen e4 attacking this knight and the pawn shouldn't be possible because I do a discovery, knight f4, and I attack the queen while also defending my g6 pawn. Cynthia Iardi saying, I don't have a preference for positional or tactical chess. Uh, it just depends on your opponent. Good point. What you do should depend on who your opponent is. And my opponent here, finding a really nice tactic, which I unfortunately missed. Uh, so I, I guess I deserve to lose this game. Um, yeah, knight g6, dang. Very unfortunate. Uh, let's try to save our rook. Let's still play for counterplay. Uh, so there's queen e4, okay? I guess that's possible. But let's try our best to to fight for some sort of advantage. If queen e4, I think we can, we can still play on. Um, but yeah, we've accidentally gambited this very important pawn on g6. So yeah, I... That, that's a pretty common mistake in chess, just like blundering the move order. I was considering queen e4 and then knight g6, but what I failed to consider was knight g6, then queen e4, which is much more forcing. So props to my opponent there for finding that. He goes queen e4, okay? Now, I was thinking I had this knight move, and I really hope I do. So if I go there, let's just play it. Uh... Now, what does my opponent do? Because I'm attacking the queen. And I'm attacking the knight. So knight of fate, good move. And now let's say I come back. And I'm still attacking the knight. I have a bunch of pieces on it. And I'm attacking the... Oh, man, queen h7. Oh, my God, totally missed it. Oh, shoot. Man, that was rough. Oh. So unfortunate, man. I guess that's what happens when uh, when you miss one tactic. Sometimes it's a snowball effect. I was streaming for like three hours today on Twitch. And then I came over to show the YouTube people some love. But man, that missing those tactics, not ideal. Okay, well... It happens. Can't beat myself up too much. Let's just jump back into the pool. Try to see if we can rebound. We're still sitting at about 2400. We're at 2397. So not too much progress has been lost. Let's just try to jump back in. Okay, we are playing against Disaster uh, 116. And let's go for the Karo Khan. 
to appease some of our followers like Shreswarup. Yeah, Max and Cynthia, sorry to let you guys down. Uh, it happens though, it's all good. We just got to learn from our losses. There I learned. Uh, I did learn something from that one that always make sure to check all the tactical possibilities, especially when your king is a little bit open. Uh, Thiago says, I like watching both play styles, positional and dynamic play are both important for every chess player. That's awesome. Uh, really like to hear that. So right here, we're entering a bit of a positional battle in which I'm going to be fighting for all of these light squares while my opponent fights for all the dark squares. So interesting uh, difference here. But yeah, I'm going to put all my pawns on light squares while my opponent does the opposite. And we're going to hope that our light square control is more important than my opponent's dark square control. Okay, so h3. Oftentimes in these sorts of positions, it's possible to wedge the pawns with something like pawn to h4. Uh, so that's something that I am considering, wedging the pawns. But I think I'll hold off one move, just go knight to h6. Although I might have just allowed this move. Did I allow that? Okay, yeah, I might have just played the only move that allows g4, so that was kind of dumb. Uh, okay, so what do we do about that? f5, I don't like this. Uh, this just gives a pawn for no reason, so we'll take it. But yeah, I was thinking my opponent could have played g4 there uh, instead. Okay, the past is in the past. Now if g4, we take, take, and we grab the rook at the end of the line, so it's not possible anymore. Uh, just to make sure my opponent can't, can't castle, I'm going to throw in this knight g3 real quick. And my intention isn't even necessarily to take the bishop. It's just saying after you go rook g1, now you're not going to be able to castle anymore. So I just want to put my opponent in that tough position. Uh, although I don't necessarily need to capture this guy. So maybe I'll go bishop to f5 before I play e6. I don't want to lock my bishop into the pawn chain. Now bishop to f4. So I have two moves I'm considering. I can take this bishop or I can step back with the knight. Both look fairly good. Uh, stepping back with the knight keeps some tension in the position. So that's tempting. But taking the bishop eliminates one of white's very good pieces. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to eliminate a good piece. And now we have some additional things to consider. So pawn to e6 is simple enough. Uh, I'm tempted to go for it. Okay, let's go pawn e6. Ensuring that we have a solid center. We're doing as I promised, putting all the pawns on light squares. Now the queen comes here and let's offer this queen trade. It's a pretty typical idea. So I'm not sure if, uh, if you guys have heard of it, but... Or if you guys have seen this idea of the queen trade on b6, accepting the doubled pawns. But it is a very common chess idea. It takes, takes. And we're just uh, opening this file for our rook. That's the idea. Max saying go berserk next game. Maybe I should. I should go berserk next game. It does depend on the rating of my opponent. So oftentimes I forget to go berserk. And then I regret it later. But yeah, it will depend on my opponent's rating. If I'm playing some 2400, I don't want to berserk. But if I'm playing someone like 1800 or less, I should do it. Now I take this pawn and this rook is trapped. So my opponent has no way out of this. Uh, he chose not to queen trade. He wanted to keep the queens on the board, presumably because he was down in material. But it has sort of backfired on him because now he's losing even more material. Uh, I have this knight also, the knight's on pre, and it's pinned to the king. So my opponent in a world of hurt right now, uh, just trying to defend all his pieces, but it's not possible. I can still take everything, uh, and we should expect a win here. Okay, now we can take this pawn with check, everything happening with check. Uh, king up, wow, bold. My opponent playing some very bold chess. Let's drop the queen back here. Just hit the rook on g1. 
The rook moves, okay. Now let's swing the knight around to a better square. If we can get the uh, if we can get the knight here, we'll be good to go. Max saying the top spot is held by a 2200. Yeah, so this particular arena, I joined this one about an hour late. So it's a two hour arena that I joined one hour in. So I don't think we'll be able to get a dub in this arena, but we will try to put together as many wins as possible. So now I want to go bishop f2, threatening bishop g3 mate. Uh, let's see how our opponent responds to this. He has to be very careful. Cynthia Ayerdi saying, a king walk by your opponent. Yep, <laughs> indeed, a king walk. Now I'm going to go g5, because right now his bishop is stopping me from going bishop g3 mate. But if I can distract the bishop, now I can get my mate in. And so we get the mate. Happy about that. We steal a checkmate from our opponent and we're back in the arena. Still 22 minutes left here. Uh, I'm happy to play you guys here. If you are a subscriber to my YouTube channel, uh, go ahead and send me a challenge. If you're new here, if you're coming in from Lee Chess, uh, I'm National Master Dave Mohan. I have a YouTube channel here and I post instructive chess videos. So if interested, go ahead and subscribe to the channel, uh, like the stream if you will, and yeah, I'm accepting some challenges. Holland Bricks saying, what's up? This is Kirkonos FFXI on Twitch. Been checking out some of your vids. Awesome. Yeah, great to have you back. Uh, you were on the Twitch stream earlier today. I, I remember that. Uh, that's awesome. Welcome, welcome back. We're just trying out some live streaming on YouTube, seeing how that goes. Uh, it's a bit of an impromptu stream, but you know, I figured might as well, uh, might as well show some love to YouTube. I haven't streamed on here before, so might as well try it out. And here we are playing Fonkster, uh, 1848. It looks like we have a challenge from Beep081. So yeah, just a just a reminder to all the uh, all the subs here on YouTube. Go ahead and send a challenge and subscribe to the channel. So we have some uh, good instructive chess stuff on here with a lot of great stuff in the works, particularly opening videos. So I have some gambits in the works, some rare gambits that I've been trying to unearth, uh, as well as some mainstream opening stuff so the uh caro khan that video series is getting developed right now as well as um yeah as well as some other opening stuff some gambits that i've been looking at okay so right here bishop to e4 interesting now i'll play d5 and i'll accept the fact that my pawn is backwards but i'm gonna try to fix that on this move so this e5 move is an attempt to both fix my backwards pawn and try to win the knight on h3. My opponent clearly has some idea here though with queen to h5, which I should be watchful of. Uh, yeah, I actually didn't see that originally, so interesting idea. Let's go queen here. Uh, I really didn't want to allow queen to h5. Maybe my opponent just hung his knight. Uh, and then just saw this queen h5 afterwards but you know it's there nonetheless cynthia saying i'm beep 081 okay cool in that case i will play you i do want to play some subs before i head off for today uh right after this arena ends i'll play some of you guys and yeah, the uh, the ultimate goal is to to get to 1,000 subs on YouTube. So I'm hoping to make that happen. We'll see. Uh, I do live stream a lot more on Twitch than I do on YouTube. So if you guys want to check that out, go ahead. Uh, we do have a bit of a different audience on on Twitch. As I can see, though, some of some of us are migrating over to YouTube as well. Uh, yeah, Max saying I'm Brundle. Awesome. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, and Daniel Siegel saying, 
Hey man, I'm the guy who donated the other week. I'm on the screen. Yes, you are. Uh, is it possible to make a video on the Nimzo Indian is black? Sure thing, you got it. I'll actually make it so that anybody... I, I'm going on the record right now. Anybody who donates $5 or more can request a video and I will make it. That is my claim. That if you donate $5 or more, my Venmo tag is at the, at the bottom of the screen. At the bottom of the screen. Any $5 or more donation, and you get a video. That is my guarantee to you. So, Daniel, I will make that video for you. Uh, Nimzo Indian as black. And most people from the white side play the uh, Queen C2 variation. So, I could focus on that one just in the interest of, uh, of that being the, the most popular variation. But... If you face some other stuff against the uh, against D4, then be sure to let me know. Daniel says, thanks. Of course, man. Of course. Our first donor. Uh, okay, now I want to somehow start attacking. Uh, one way to do that seems to be Bishop C5. Unleashing an attack on the F2 pawn and the E5 pawn. But I'm not entirely convinced by this because bishop c5, there is f4. So now I'm thinking I should throw in this check. And that could be a good move. That's what I'm thinking about. Um, okay, so let's say I give this check. Now I'm forcing him to react and I'm also attacking the e5 pawn. So we got both of those things going on. Uh, if he goes pawn to c3, I'm thinking about this tactic where we take the pawn on e5, he blocks, and then we take on c3. So we're sacking a piece, but we get the rook at the end of the line. Queen takes a1. We get this at the end. So that's why I'm considering it. Uh, also, guys, make sure to challenge me to 5 plus 0 casual. So, if you already challenged me, uh, just if you could um, make that challenge one more time, just remake the challenge and make it so that it's a 5 plus 0 casual game. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty good standard um, time control for us to follow. Okay, now my opponent clearly wants to castle kingside, so I'm thinking about exchanging and then making some move that prevents him from doing that, like bishop to h3. That seems like a tempting option. Uh, and then I'm trying to make the king get stuck in the center, but then he can go queenside. So I don't really want to allow that. I can also go queen takes on b2, which I think I'll do, just grab a pawn, and if he takes, I'll take back. Welcome to those who are just joining the stream. Uh, I'm currently playing a 10-0 Lee Chess Arena, and right after I'm going to be playing the wonderful people of YouTube, the YouTube subscribers, also known as the members of the Tower of Power. So uh, it's a very, very intimidating name, but they all seem like nice people. Uh, all right, let's drop back. Now, I want to solidify. I'm up some material, so might as well just solidify with c6. Make sure my pawns are protected. Uh, bring the bishop in, maybe like this. And I have to say I'm happy with the position. So queen c2. Now, clearly, my opponent is attacking this pawn. I will defend. Uh, so I can either go g6 or h6. And each of them has their own uh, point. So the point of g6 would be uh, blunt this diagonal altogether. And the point of h6 would be uh, not to allow any sort of sacrifice. But g6 does seem like the more viable option the more I look at it. Because h6, I'm afraid of weakening the g6 square. So I didn't want to allow any sort of um, knight f4, knight into g6. So I go g6. And my opponent castles, okay. That's fair. Uh, and I'm thinking now about c6. This seems like a pretty good move to me. Just solidifying everything in the center. 
Uh, my opponent really going for it here with pawn to h4. I like it, but I'm also fearful. Let's see. I'm thinking about bishop to f5 uh, just to try and get rid of some of the pressure here. Yeah, bishop f5 seems like a very reasonable move. We're offering a bishop trade, and we're hoping that at some point, uh, if our opponent goes h5, we can go g5 and stop him. Okay, so knight to f4. I guess just bringing another piece into the attack can't hurt. I respect that move, so I'll go here. And I also want to bring another piece into the attack. Pawn to h5. Now I'm actually going to exchange these bishops really quickly so that my bishop isn't hanging. And now I'll go g5. And I'm just attacking the knight. Uh, and what I was thinking was if he plays this intermediate rookie one move, I can actually make a check is what I thought. And when the king moves, I take the knight. Although this is getting really, really dicey, uh, I will admit that, that that position is pretty sketchy. So queen a3 check, king moves, I take this knight, he takes back. And am I getting mated there? I hope not. Uh, okay, let's do it. Queen a3 check with the idea of picking up the knight. And I'm just hoping I don't get mated, even though it's looking like it could happen. We'll see. We will see. Only time will tell. Rookie 7, I was hoping he'd make this mistake. My queen actually defends that square. So he makes the mistake we needed him to make. We get a resignation. Still a little bit of time left in this arena, but we all know that we're not going to win it since we entered an hour late. So let me go ahead and play the people. Uh, I see Beep is here with a casual 5-0 challenge. Brundle, if you would, uh, if you would change your challenge to 5 plus 0 and casual. All right, now we're playing Beep, playing the YouTube subscribers. That's what we're here to do. So Beep, if you're there, or Cynthia, E4. Okay, cool. Let's go for the Karo Khan. Just because I have a video series on it, I gotta play it. That's how it works. Okay, e5, let's go c5. We're gonna play the c5 variation against the advanced. Alright. Beep, 0a1, playing a lot like one of my other opponents. Someone played this exact thing in the arena, except they went f4. Okay, knight to f3, let's go bishop g4, create this pin. And let's see how Cynthia wants to deal with the pin. There are a couple different ways to go. This is one of them, definitely, what Cynthia has played. Uh, and now let's go for this e6 move. There is some sort of... Oh, yeah, there's... There's supposed to be some, like, trick in this line that I don't know. Uh, okay, so... What if we take and put the queen on b6? This seems like a pretty natural way to develop. Maybe I take this first and then go queen to b6. Uh, but yeah, this is just natural development. I'm pretty happy with uh, how my pieces are coming out so far. We did give up the bishop pair, but it is possible that we get it back. So I'm not too concerned at the moment. And wow, interesting move by Cynthia here. Castle's kingside. Really going for it. Okay, I'm going to try to hang on to my pawn uh, because that's what I do. I'm, I'm a pawn grabber. Just like Yasser Sarawan. Uh, and yeah, now after takes, we can take back with our queen. Not sure if Cynthia wants to do that. Otherwise, we can try to develop our pieces. Uh, White's biggest advantage in this position is that she's castled already. And we're not castled. So let's try to change that. If we can change that dynamic of the position, then we'll be in a much better position to start pressing. So we're trying to get the knight out, and then once we get the bishop out and castle, I think we can claim an advantage because we're up a pawn. But if Cynthia is able to do something horrible to us in the time that it takes for us to castle, then we're in big trouble. 
So instead of taking this pawn back right away, what I'm trying to do is bring the knight in so I can take with the knight. And if, uh, if my opponent goes here to defend, now we take and we're trading off a piece in the process. So not only are we uh, gaining the pawn back, but we're trading a piece also. And that's an important feature. Now, we are threatening the e5 pawn. So something like bishop to e3 would drop e5, uh, which we'd probably take. And we're also threatening to just go bishop e7 and castle. And it's weird to frame that in such a way that it's a threat. But in reality, that's, that's what it is. We are threatening to get safe. And once we get safe, our opponent might be in some trouble. Okay, so now we've queen traded for someone rated 1209. Uh, Cynthia is playing some incredible chess. So props to you for playing some great moves. Uh, and now it's actually a good thing that we didn't castle because the queens are off the board. And since the queens are off the board, we can allow our king to jump to the center. Uh, and... We're doing all right. So, yeah. Um, the king in the center isn't that big a deal when, uh, when the queens are off the board. Now my king won't be able to be easily attacked. So it's okay for me to leave it in the center. A3, I'm going to play A5 just to stop Cynthia's idea of expanding with B4. So putting a hamper on my opponent's plans, generally a good way to go. Now, I can even start to, to wedge the pawns with a4 if, uh, if Cynthia's not too careful. a4 would be a good move, also establishing b3 as an outpost for my rook if I can swing over. And I mostly just want to concentrate my efforts over on the queen side, and that appears to be Cynthia's plan as well. So, okay, bishop to c5. Interesting. Uh... The idea is, is to trade into a rook ending, and I actually like that idea a lot for, uh, for Cynthia. So I think she's making some really good moves that seem to fit the spirit of the position very well. Let's see if there's anything we can do about that. Uh, maybe drop the bishop back. I'm not entirely certain I want to trade right here. Uh, so I, I don't really know if I want to trade, so I'm going to avoid the trade for now. Let's go bishop back to d8 and see what Cynthia wants to do. Max is asking, is there an advantage to moving the king to the center instead of castling when the queens are off? Yeah, so generally in the end game, you want your king to be in the center because it can contribute more easily to, uh, to the attack campaign of winning the pawns at some point so uh the king is a very useful piece they say that's worth three points in the ending which i am inclined to believe that that evaluation is correct uh so yeah it, it's it's worth a couple points in the ending because you can use it to your advantage uh all right let's go bishop into c7 and just get the bishop off of the eighth rank make sure our rooks can look at each other that's a very valuable thing in this position. Make sure that the rooks are connected. This rook can swing over easily. Okay, f4 protecting the pawn. And now we'll go g6. So we're going to try and use our pawns on the king side as well. Uh, but my opponent playing a very good game here. Uh, almost, I'd say, n not at the 1200 level, but almost at the like 1900 level maybe. So yeah, awesome. Uh, G4, strong move. Now I'm thinking of doing a couple of different things. Uh, I think one, one way to go is just rook to G8. I do want to play H5 at some point, break things open. Uh, maybe I should have done that on the last move, actually. H5 might have been a better way to go. Uh, but it is getting a little bit unclear. I have a pretty good advantage on the clock. Max is asking, why would a rook endgame be better for Cynthia than for you? Uh, that's a good question, Max. So actually, it would not be better for Cynthia. It would still be better for me. 
but the reason that I kept the rooks on the board is to retain as many chances as possible. So if I keep the, or sorry, the reason I kept the bishops on the board, because if I keep the bishops on the board, uh, then it's easier for me to uh, convert into an advantage. Uh, just because generally the more pieces you have, the easier it is to try and play for a win. Which is why sometimes people avoid queen trades at all costs when they play lower rated players. Now this h5 move I played was with the idea of coming around and taking this pawn. Which is what we'll do. Uh, let's take this first. Rook takes a5. Uh, can't hurt to just steal a pawn. And then we'll come back to take h6. So... This is what we'd call a temporary pawn sacrifice. We sacked the h pawn, but then we came around and took it back. And now we control the h file. Our rook can come to f5 if we want, also h4. So we have some good outposts for our pieces, which I'm not mad at at all. Uh, now I can transition to an ending here by taking and going bishop to b6, but I'm only up one pawn. I think I'll do it anyways, takes, and bring the bishop to b6. Uh, and the point is, we're simplifying by means of sacrifice. Uh, this rook is pinned to the king, so there's nowhere the king can go, and we get a flag. So good game to Cynthia, you played incredibly well. Uh, very, very good game. And we have a challenge from Brundle. Let's do it. Max. All right, so we're playing with the white pieces here. Let's go e4. And just to clarify for anybody who's just joining, we are playing the YouTube subscribers. So all you got to do to be eligible for a game is sub subscribe to the YouTube channel, and uh, and I'll play you. 5 plus 0 casual games. That's what we're doing today. Cynthia says, thank you very much. Thank you, Cynthia, for, the, for a great game. Uh... Yeah, thanks so much. Appreciate it. And uh, thanks for tuning into the stream. So now we have bishop c4. Let's do the same thing as we did in, in the arena where we're going to play f4. Uh, try to get more control of the center. This is called the Vienna Gambit. Uh, yeah, it's like, it's like the King's Gambit, but we already have the knight on c3. So it's a slightly better version. And after this game, if there are no more challengers, uh, okay, bishop c5, Cynthia playing in the style of, uh, of that one guy in the arena. <laughs> yeah, so if there are no other challengers after this, we can call it a day. But do challenge me on, on Lee Chess. I should actually probably drop the username. Uh... I'll put it in the chat right now. My username on Lee Chess is just giraffe chess with an underscore. I just put it in there. So that's where you can challenge me on Lee Chess. Happy to play you guys. Uh, okay. Now let's go pawn to d3. Just uh, keep an eye on this guy. Okay, so... Brundle playing very well. Max. Now he goes d6. Let's go pawn to h3 because we don't want to allow this bishop to come in and wreak any havoc on our position. Uh, and we could also be playing g4 at some point. Who knows? That could be an idea for sure. Thiago Rondon saying, is the Vienna Gambit playable at the high level? I think it is, yeah. Uh, it's definitely a very playable gambit. One thing that uh, top grandmasters like to take into account, I feel, is that if I'm playing with the white pieces, why should I be playing a gambit uh, if I can just get an advantage normally? But if you are a very dynamic player and you struggle to get advantages and grind out those small advantages, then a gambit isn't such a bad idea. So knight to d4 is the try here. Pretty good move. I like it. Um, and now I'm deciding between releasing the tension, f takes e5, and building the tension with f5. Uh, it's a tough choice here for sure. But I think I'm actually going to opt for the latter. I'm going to play f5. 
Uh, and the idea here is we are opening up the diagonal for our bishop, and we're stopping our opponent's bishop from developing to a very natural square. So e6 is where the bishop would naturally want to go to, but we stop that by going f5. I'm starting to think that this uh, live stream, this YouTube live stream, could be a really uh, useful tool because even when I'm recording my normal uh, subscriber game analysis stuff or even, um, even the standard chess videos that I do for the YouTube channel, I think that just uh, live streaming that might be beneficial. So okay, now we're going to play this tricky knight to d5 move. We established this pin, so now if Max takes our knight, we can take his queen. And uh, if the queen moves, now we take the knight and take the pawn. Uh, and that's the advantage of having such a pin, that we get, uh, we get moves that put pressure on the pin. And when you pressure a pinned piece, sometimes that pinned piece will, uh, will fall. There's too much pressure. So, okay, in this position, I would expect queen to d8, just because it still keeps an eye on the f6 knight. Uh, just to repeat what I had said before, what we're going to do is, for every $5 donation or more, uh, every $5 donation or more, I'm going to make a video based on your recommendation. So, tentatively, I can offer that, that anybody who donates $5 or more gets a video dedicated to whatever they want. Uh, Daniel over here already has his Nimzo Indian video requested, so that will be in the works soon. And we'll see if uh, we'll see if anybody else gets some gets some videos. So now we're going to take back with the queen and this king on g8 is looking like it's in some serious trouble. Uh, yeah, very, very tough spot. So he tries to escape. I like it. Uh, definitely the best way to go. And now, how do I keep up the pressure? That's the million dollar question. I gotta, I gotta somehow uh, make sure that my initiative doesn't die. So let's go queen h5. It is tempting to just take this piece, but I do want to keep the pressure. So let's go queen out to h5. Uh, if rook to h8 he loses a defender on this pawn so there's got to be something juicy there maybe bishop f8 king moves and then i mate on f7 so he's got to be careful with that kind of stuff king g8 okay but now i have this tricky move queen to g6 and now we can say like simon williams does boom uh because we get to mate this is a pretty common uh, motif that when you have this bishop pinning against the king, the queen can safely come to this square as there's no threat of captures due to the pin. Oops, that's the wrong arrow. Due to the pin. So great game to Max. You played well. He's saying good game well played. Same to you. Saying thanks for the game. You're welcome. Thank you for the game. And thank you for subscribing to the channel. So okay, those were both good games. I don't see any other challenges here, so I'm thinking about calling it, but before I do, just a quick reminder, uh, on uh, on the channel, it helps a lot if, uh, if you guys subscribe. Every subscription helps a ton. Uh, on the goal, on, on track to our goal for 1,000 subscribers. Also, liking and commenting helps a lot. Uh, I'm recently learning, I've recently started learning about the YouTube algorithm, so basically uh, any like or comment helps my videos a ton. Uh, with that, I'm going to sign off, but I will see you guys in the next one. I'm going to try to do some more streaming on YouTube. Uh,